All right, how y'all feeling? Are we fired up today? Yeah. My name is Sean Blackman. I'm here with the Answer Coalition. That means act now to stop war and end racism. I will be co-chairing today's demonstration along with my friend Leo Flores from Code Pink. You'll be hearing from him as well. But in case there was any confusion about why we are out here today, it is because we stand against the United States government and its unilateral bombing in Iraq, its ongoing war of occupation in Iraq, its killing of Iranian officials, its saber rattling and trying to instigate a, a, a war scenario with Iran, trying to bring Iran under the boot of U.S. imperialism so that the U.S. can complete its plans for full spectrum dominance in the Middle East. We are here to stand against that. We are here to say, stop bombing in Iraq. No war or sanctions in Iran. U.S. out of Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. The U.S. out of the Middle East. Right. And so we are here today to say, hands off Iraq. Hands off Iraq. Hands off Iraq. Say it. Hands off Iraq. 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 So we're saying hands off Iraq, hands off Iran. And I'm going to have my uh, co-host Leo talk to you for just a moment. And we'll get started with our program today of speakers to expound upon why we are demonstrating here against this ongoing uh, criminal war actions by the United States government. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. Um, my name is Leo Flores. I'm with Code Pink. Uh, there's a lot of groups here today. We've got Answer, Code Pink, Popular Resistance, Veterans for Peace. A bunch of people are coming out, a bunch of organizations are coming out to build this anti-war movement that's incredibly necessary at this time because the Trump administration has taken an incredibly dangerous step and is escalating their war on Iran. This is a war that has in, been going on for years now, since 2017, with the economic sanctions, which are economic war. This is a war that's getting hotter, and with the murder of General Soleimani, they've taken us towards the precipice, if not over it. And what we have to do, our responsibility here in the United States, is to show the people of Iran and to show the people of Iraq that there are American citizens who are against these endless wars, that there are American citizens who want peace and friendly relations between our people, that there are American citizens who are saying no more Pentagon spending, no more endless wars, no more environmental pollution caused by the military, no more deaths of innocent people in Iraq, in Iran, in Yemen, in Syria, in Afghanistan, all over the Middle East. We have to stop these wars in, in the Middle East, and that's why we're here today, and we have to make this movement grow. So everyone has, we have to take personal responsibility and, and start reaching out to more folks and, and have them come out and join us uh, for future actions. So what do we, let's start a quick chant right now. When the Re Iranian people are under attack, what do we do? What do we do? When the people of Iraq are under attack, what do we do? What do we do? That's right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yasmin Zara. I'm with an organization called U.S. Labor Against the War. Uh, we have one of our founders here in the crowd. His name is Gene. Say hi, Gene. A uh, little bit about the organization. We were founded in 2003 to oppose George Bush's war on Iraq. In the summer of 2005, our founders called for an immediate withdrawal of our soldiers on the, the floor of the AFL-CIO convention. It was the first time in labor history where a major federation took a stance against the war, entirely bottom-up and led by working-class people. A truly a watershed moment in, in labor history. So shout out to Jean for, for being a, a, a huge leader in that effort. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, Today we, we heed the same call demanding an immediate withdrawal of our troops and no war on Iran. No it is always poor and working people who suffer 
the most, who lose the most in a rich man's war for greed, uh, for money and oil. Uh, and they need us, the working class. We don't need them to carry out their wars, to murder and burn working class people on the other side. Uh, they do need us, but we don't need them. Say with me, the bosses need us. We don't need them. 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 That's right. We can build a country without billionaires where we tackle the real wars. The war on poverty, the war on racism, the war on militarism. Those are the real wars that working class people care about. That's right. The, the, the real enemy are the bosses, and they're right here at home in our backyard. Those are the people who we are up against. I've been an organizer on the ground for about 10 years, and what I've heard from working class people, what their real needs are, are universal health care, are quality good jobs with good pay and good benefits, support for our homeowners and renters, uh, to demilitarize the police and to actually invest in rebuilding our public schools and our nation's infrastructure. Those are some of the needs of working class people along with saving our planet and reducing our carbon footprint. Our brothers, our sisters, our cousins in Iran and Iraq, what they, what they really need is labor's hand in solidarity, not, war, not more bombs and sanctions that we sent to them. Uh, U.S. Labor Against the War, those are our demands. And if you are a trade unionist out in the audience, come talk to me. We need you on our side to build the anti-war front for the labor movement. Thank you so much. It's no justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East. No justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East. No justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East. No justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East. No justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East, no justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East, no justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East, no justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East, no justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East. All right, we want to thank Yasmin Zara for speaking to us. I'm so glad she made that point about the struggles of poor and working people even though this was a, this bombing in Iraq was a unilateral move by Trump, we know that just the other day, Republicans and Democrats passed a defense bill that was $738 billion. Think, think about what you and I could do with that money as just regular people in this country trying to live. Think of the health care we could have. Think of the access to education we can have. We're here in D.C. Think of the affordable housing we could have. Think of how we could address homelessness with some of that money. So it seems that this government has no interest in investing in things that sustain life, but wants to invest in things that bring death, destruction, bloodshed, and misery to folks all over this world. And so that is why what we're doing today is so important, because this, this unity and coming together that we have today is what's really going to strike a blow against uh, these imperial efforts by the United States government. And you all should know that this is not just happening in Washington, D.C. This is a nationwide day of action against U.S. imperialism in Iraq, Iran, and the Middle East. We are one of 72, 72 cities and towns in the United States are doing exactly what we're doing now in taking this collective effort. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're not just here in front of the White House, we're, we're in 72 cities and towns around the United States, and this has happened in three days. This has happened in three days. And what does it, what does it really indicate? It shows that the people of the United States, the people, whether they're liberal or conservative, Republican, Democrat, independent, socialist, whatever they are, they 
don't want another Iraq. They don't want another Afghanistan. They don't want another Libya. They don't want another Vietnam. Because guess what? A war with Iran will be more like the war with Vietnam than it was with Iraq. Iran has 80 million people, an educated population, a strong military, a strong economy. Whether you like the government or don't like the government, the fact of the matter is the United States, this administration, Donald J. Trump, does not have the right to violate international law, to violate the United Nations Charter, to violate the War Powers Resolution, and start a war of aggression without knowing, and he doesn't know, and the generals don't know, what the outcome will be. There's a trending phrase on Twitter right now, and it's World War III. There's a reason for that. All the media is asking us, why is World War III trending? Oil. World War III is trending because if the United States goes to war against Iran, which has allies with Russia and China, how would anyone not think that this could be a repeat of World War I and World War II? Those wars were not a fantasy. They actually happened. They happened because leaders made decisions that took the world not only to the brink of catastrophe, but over the brink. Are we going to stand by and let that happen? Are we going to stand by and say to Donald Trump, oh well, you are the president and you have the right to do this? Of course we cannot say yes to that because it means not only a violation of everything legal, of everything moral, of everything ethical, it's a violation of what it means to be alive. When the U.S. bombs Iranians, they say, well, they're Iranians, they're not our people. Our message here today is the Iranians and the Iraqis and the Palestinians and the Vietnamese and the Koreans are our people. We, we are human beings. We are human beings. We are part of one human family, and we have to stop the war makers. That's why we're here. Good afternoon. It is amazing that in such short notice, and so telling that on such short notice, people are mobilized here in Lafayette Park, in front of the White House, and in more than 72 cities all across the United States. People are turning out to say that they're not going to stand by and let the Trump administration or the generals in the Pentagon take this country into another war and wage a war in the Middle East that will have global implications, a war that is so dangerous, so reckless, that all of us, all of us here and people all over the United States and people all over the world are now afraid afraid because you have a man in the White House that has talked about using nuclear weapons. Why can't we use our nuclear weapons, he says. That's the person who is in charge of the nuclear weapons. And all of us are here to say that we're not going to stand by, we will not be silent, we will not allow our country to be led into another dangerous, reckless war. And a war that will kill thousands hundreds of thousands, millions of people. The Iraq War, as we know, killed millions of people. A war of aggression led by the former occupant, a former occupant, George W. Bush. And many of us stood out here then. And just as then, this is a war of aggression. It is illegal under the UN Charter. The UN Charter that was ratified in 1945 after World War II, because countries came together and said, we don't ever want to have this happen again. The UN Charter, which articles state that no country, and the US ratified the UN Charter in 1945, that no country can wage a war of aggression or threaten another country. And the only time that an act of military force can be taken is in self-defense, and the self-defense has to be such that there is an immediate 
absolute overwhelming threat that does not allow for a moment of deliberation. That is not the circumstances we are in. What the administration just did, what Trump just did, was an act of war and it was illegal. And more than anything, we know it was wrong and it was dangerous. So looking at what we're faced with right now and the violation of the War Powers Act, a critical resolution that was introduced by Congress after Vietnam to ensure once again that something like Vietnam wouldn't happen. And yet Congress has repeatedly sat back and given repeated blank checks to the administrations because they don't want to take responsibility. They want to criticize or support, but they don't want to take responsibility. So all of us, it's incumbent upon all of us and all of the people across the United States in more than 72 cities to stand up and demand accountability, to stand up and say, we are not going to allow this to happen. And we are not going to sit back and allow another war and slaughter to engulf people who are not our enemies. I went to Iraq in the months leading up to the invasion of Iraq. And I went on a peace delegation. And everywhere I went, people asked me, why does your country hate us? Why are they bombing us? Young women, young men, families asking us over and over, why are you doing this to us? And there was no rational answer I could give except to tell them that I knew that there were millions of people back in the United States who did not want it to happen and who were willing to stand up and stop an, uncommon, an, an upcoming slaughter. And people did, people fought, people stood for what they believe in. But even now, you look at what happened yesterday after the assassination, what happened? Oil prices went up. It's good for the fossil fuels industry. It was good for the oil companies. It's incredible. And, and as someone saying, it's good for the defense contractors. But when we're talking about fossil fuels, and we're talking about the military, and talking about the oil companies, and talking about who benefits from these wars, and from these threats of wars, I think it's important to talk about the other massive crisis that we're facing right now, which is the climate crisis which is an extraordinary, existential, absolute, defined threat that without question is going to steal and destroy our children's futures, the any, any hope of our children's futures if we do not act to stop it. And I'm very honored and we're very excited that we have with us now today Jane Fonda, who has tirelessly and courageously stood for justice, for peace, and has, for the last months, been in Washington, D.C., week after week, organizing thousands of people to come to Washington, D.C. and in Washington, D.C., to stand up, to demand a Green New Deal, to demand an end to fossil fuels extraction. Under her organizing and brilliant leadership, there are hundreds of people who have taken acts of conscience who have risked arrest and acted in civil disobedience because they know that the threat is real and that it's incumbent upon the people to act. So I'm very, very pleased and thrilled to introduce Jane Fonda. I wanted to be here because I wanted to express to everybody that the climate movement and the peace movement must be one movement. The younger people here should know that all of the wars that have been fought since you've been born have been fought over oil. The bombing in New York and here at the Pentagon and elsewhere on 9-11 was about oil. Because for decades, U.S. troops were stationed in the Middle East to guard oil. And troops were stationed on sacred sites, sites that are 
sacred, holy to the people of that region. Did we not know that? Did we once again not learn the lessons of Vietnam? Not bother to understand the people that we were shaming and insulting? Not to mention killing? And the environments there that we are destroying and the children that are dying of toxins because of the gassing? And all of the things that the U.S. has been doing there so, please understand, the Pentagon is the biggest institutional user of fossil fuel in the world. <laughs> that we can't anymore lose lives and kill people and ruin an environment because of oil and fossil fuels. <laughs> Brian said that the war in Iraq was started by Bush. No, it was started by Cheney. Halliburton. It's always been about oil. Oil is killing people in the Middle East. The wars around oil are killing them, and oil is killing us here, killing our climate, causing fires in Australia. We have to stop it. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. out of the stranglehold of the fossil fuel industry and take back our democracy. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you all for being out here. Thank, thanks to those who supported us as we face federal charges for protecting the Venezuelan embassy. Uh, we really appreciate it. Our trial will be coming up in February. Uh, we have a number of embassy protectors here today. And so thank you all for being part of that effort. It was a group effort. It was a collective. I want to thank Jane Fonda for uniting the peace movement with the climate movement. Yeah. Uniting these movements will create transformational change. Yeah. Yeah. Transformational change. This is the decade that we will face up to climate, that we will face up to the Pentagon. We will put in place a peace economy based on clean, renewable, and sustainable energy. That is the future we are developing. The reckless attack, the reckless assassination by Donald Trump against the commander of the Iranian forces is living in the past. That is a war for oil. We don't need any wars for oil. That era is over. In fact, the era of the United States causing chaos in the Middle East needs to end. Not only do we want to stop the war with Iran, we want the United States out of the Middle East. Since 2003, since the United States attacked and occupied Iraq, uh, since then the U.S. has destroyed Libya, Obama started the war in Syria, still going on. We have caused chaos throughout that region. Yemen is being slaughtered by the United States and Saudi Arabia. And what we're seeing now, we're starting to come into focus on a reality. We are in a global world war right now. The Middle East is the battleground for that war, but that battleground will shift and expand. We see already the escalation between the U.S. and North Korea. We see this last week in Venezuela, Brazil tried to attack Venezuela from the south. There were supposed to be simultaneous attacks from Colombia and from the Pacific at the three attacks at the same time. Only one occurred and that was stopped by the Venezuelan government. So global war is with us. We already see Russia involved in the Middle East. We saw last week China and Russia join with Iran to show the United States that there's unity against US imperialism. We see the United States reaching out to Saudi Arabia and Israel to expand this regional war that's escalating out of control. This already is a world war. We just haven't faced it. And during this world war, we see incredible weapons races between the US and Russia and China and other nations. The nuclear weapons race started under Obama with a trillion dollar, 10 year plan to improve and expand our nuclear capacity. 
is continuing expanding under Donald Trump, the nuclear weapons race. And now, now we see a space weapons race developing. That weapons race will make all the previous uh, weapons contractors wealthier. And uh, the weapons race will be larger than we have ever seen in history when the outer space becomes the new battleground. So what we are here now in the beginning of 2020 is a critical year. It's a critical year for us to show both parties that militarism and war are no longer supported by the people of the United States. When Elizabeth Warren starts her comment on the, assass the illegal assassination with saying what a bad guy he was and he should have died, that's unacceptable. Only Bernie Sanders said the right thing. Only Bernie Sanders said that the Iraq war was a mistake, and he said that the assassination was a mistake, and escalation is a mistake. That's exactly right. Donald Trump ran on a campaign claiming the wars in the Middle East were, were a mistake, were wasting trillions of dollars, and here he is escalating those wars. We need to make it clear to those who supported Donald Trump that he was a con man. They lied to them. We know Hillary was a warmonger. We know that. But Donald Trump pretended to be opposed to Middle East wars. And here he is, violating international law and escalating those wars. So it's time for us in 2020 to build a peace movement that cannot be ignored. This, you here today, you here today are on the cutting edge of that new movement. This movement's going to expand this year to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. This is just the beginning. Today, more than 80 cities in, in 38 states are holding protests to say no to the war in Iraq, to say U.S. out of the Middle East. We are going to accomplish these objectives. We're going to create a new world. The peace economy is our future. Thank you all for being here. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out here. Uh, my name is Hajra. I'm with the George Washington University Students Against Imperialism. We are an anti-war, anti-militarization, anti-occupation, anti-apartheid group on campus, standing up against, yeah, students standing up against war, endless war, endless occupation, endless domination that the United States has been inflicting upon the global south for centuries. And right now, plain as day, the mask is off. The mask is off on U.S. imperialism. That's right. The media, CNN, New York Times, MSNBC, they're parroting their Pentagon and State Department lies. They want us to believe that is it, that's an, it's imperative for us to go to war, that poor Iranians, poor Iraqis are our enemies, that we have to be there, we have to bomb them. Am I missing something? How does war bring peace? You know, Democrats and Republicans alike just passed a $738 billion defense budget. We can clearly tell $738 billion in the hands of big CEOs at Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing is money out of the pockets, out of the food out of the mouths of Americans, of poor working Americans. And on climate change, and the note of climate change, we're, we're in a current climate catastrophe. Australia is currently burning. Indonesia is uh, uh, underwater right now. And this, this war for oil, this onslaught, never ends. Bodies will pile, the earth will be destroyed further and further while the rich get richer. And we're here to say no. You know, they, the U.S., the imperialist on both sides, the media, the corporate media, fed us the, the lie that we had to go into Iraq. If you look at Iraq now with the use of depleted uranium, you have generations, you have babies being born with, with mutations. You have increased cancer rates. This is war. This is war and violence that continues for generations. And we're here today. I want to I thank all of you for being here today. 
the young people, the older people, everyone. Because in this new decade, in 2020, we are standing up against war. We are standing up against yeah. occupation. Yeah. We're standing up against apartheid. Yeah. We're standing up against U.S. imperialism. Yeah. We are building an anti-war movement. Yeah. And we're not going to let this happen anymore. No more business as usual. We're standing up. We're not feeding the lies they, they serve to us in, in shiny new uh, directions on both sides. We're standing up. And so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna keep the intensity going. Let's go in with a chant. Um, Stop the sanctions and the war. No more violence on the poor. Stop the sanctions and the war. No more violence on the poor. Stop the sanctions and the war. No more violence on the poor. Stop the sanctions and the war. No more violence on the poor. Stop the sanctions and the war. The U.S. government has carried out a war against the people of the Congo for one simple reason. They want the minerals that are in the ground, which is roughly about $24 trillion worth of minerals. About 85% of the people here who have a cell phone have minerals coming out of the Congo. And the way they're going about doing it is they are supplying weapons and training and logistical help to the neighboring countries of Uganda and Rwanda who crossed the border and attacked innocent villages who happen to be living on top of those minerals because the mining companies know they can't mine the minerals if people are living on top of them. The result of that is from 1996 to 2006, the United Nations estimate that 6 million people were killed in the Congo, the eastern part of the Congo alone. And over half of them, three million of them, were children below the age of five. At the same time, the second largest rainforest in the world is in the Congo. And they have been burning those fires to get the trees out of the way, to get access to those minerals. And again, we have the United States turning, in its media, turning a blind eye to the burning of the forests in the Congo, while now it's creating a great deal of floods inside of the Congo because the Congolese River is now going over its banks and affecting people's farms, as well as drowning livestock. So the United States is carrying out an imperial war against people of color in particular. They're doing it in Iraq. They're doing it in Afghanistan, and they're doing it in Africa. Many people have heard about African Command, where the United States decides to expand its military influence on the continent of Africa. It was started by George Bush, but George Bush was only able to get three military bases put on the continent of Africa. So the corporations funded and backed Obama. And during his eight years, on an average, he put 10 military bases per year in Africa. People were surprised when they heard about the four soldiers being killed in Niger. But the fact is, we got secret bases all over the continent of Africa because the continent of Africa has oil and it has minerals. And U.S. corporations and U.S. banks want access to that. And you can control the government if you got a gun sitting in their face. So, again, we say no more wars. We say that the only way forward in this election year is for everyone to insist that their political candidate commits to cutting the military budget by 50%, no less than 50%. That creates the money necessary for the health care that some of the candidates are talking about. That, could, that allows for the money. That allows for us to have affordable housing. That allows for the money for us to have our students to go to school without being in debt for the rest of their lives. So again, we say no war. We say peace is the only way forward. 
Thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, yeah, I'm a, um, I'm in no means I'm a supporter of the Iranian government for what they do inside Iran. And as a non-violence activist, I don't want to cry for a general, for an army general, but I have to confess I have done it since the moment I've heard that because he is, he was, he is very popular. I believe he was not, he is not only a name, but rather he's an identity, identity of an Iranian. He's the one who helped to destroy ISIS behind the doors of Iran. And he destroyed ISIS all over the Middle East. He's the one who has, interestingly, has enemies from ISIS to Jebhat al-Nusra to American new liberalists who want to have the hegemony of the region, Israelis and Saudis. And that means, I think, he has done something good, that he has majority of these differences of, as his enemy. I cried a lot because he was and he is like the symbol of the peace in the country, inside the country, and he helped many people. We still stand for peace and diplomacy, and the moment this guy came to the office, he destroyed that path for with coming out of the, um, um, the deal, Iran deal, the nuclear deal, and he has continued that to this moment. We still stand for peace and diplomacy and hopefully it will have a result. No more war, no more death for the region and for all of us. We have been destroyed here in our home and there in other people's home. We destroyed them, we destroyed their lives. And I do not understand what was the reason for this latest action. I really cannot get it. What did bring, what kind of good that brought to us, for us and the Middle East? Thank you, and please continue this. Hey, everybody. This is really great to see so many people out here that want to reject a war of choice with Iran, and that know that diplomacy is really the only way we, we have to go forward with this situation. I am really just disheartened by what the Trump administration has done and set us on a path for war, destruction, and more chaos. I want to tell you a little bit about why I do this stuff. My, my family is from Jordan, and I grew up, and people used to say all sorts of disparaging things about my nationality, and they had me feeling pretty low, and then that was before 9-11. And then 9-11 happened, and it got even worse. And then we saw the Iraq War, and I, I just couldn't understand why America hated Arabs and Muslims so much. Then I went to the Middle East and I got to meet my family for the first time. And they were incredible. I mean, my, my parents split up. It's a little bit too much information. But my, I grew up here and I didn't really have any connection with that side of my family. When I went to Jordan, I met some of the most amazing people I've ever met. And my heart breaks to know that the war in Syria has caused their life you know, so much misery. The, the war in Iraq has caused so much misery. Uh, what's going on with Israel-Palestine and all the Palestinian refugees is causing so much misery. And at the heart of all this is U.S. imperialism. It's the United States wanting to assert global hegemony. And this is not a zero-sum game. Our decision to, to kill this Iranian general, Soleimani, basically shows that the people running this country are a bunch of imperial chauvinists who don't have any regard for human life, and we need to stop them. Now, I have a little message of hope. This year, for the first time, well, actually last year, we were able to get Congress to work in a bipartisan way to try to shut down the war in Yemen, and they passed the War Powers Resolution. Republicans and Democrats, we can come together on this issue of ending endless war. And that's what 2020 has to be all about. We need to go to town halls. We need to make sure our legislators hear from us, that they reassert their Article 1, Section 8 war authority. None of this BS of the president gets to go to war whenever he or she wants. No. Congress gets to decide, and our job as a peace movement is to make sure 
our legislators stand up for peace. And I just am so happy to be in this fight with you all. Thank you all. Black Alliance for Peace declares, if you believe in peace, commit to defeating the war mongers. No war on Iran! Turn imperialist wars into wars in, against imperialism. The Black Alliance for Peace back is clear. We will not fight for the rich. Uh -huh. We understand our objective interests as an oppressed people and will not be moved by appeals to national chauvinism meant to galvanize the poor and working class to support wars of choice initiated by the white supremacist colonial capitalist oligarchy. Yes. BAP opposes war with, with Iran is, and is supporting the national mobilizations this weekend demanding no war on Iran and the withdrawal of all U.S. troops from Iraq. Yes. But BAP also calls on all progressive forces to join us to fight the domestic military surge, to oppose the training of U.S. police forces by the Israeli state, to struggle to shut down AFRICOM, to demand the closing of over 800 U.S. bases worldwide, to advocate against the normalization of nuclear war, and to expose the collaboration of self-defined progressive and radical forces with the U.S. war state. All right, bear with me. They cannot have us. We will struggle against them for ourselves and for humanity. Yes. Dr. King warned about the spiritual death of the U.S. with its addiction to war and militarism. It's materialism and extreme social alienation, sorry, alienation, but he was wrong. He was wrong. The spiritual death of what became the United States occurred in 1619 when the settlers imported the first Africans and decided to expand beyond the coast of the country by force, resulting in monstrosity called the United States today. We who believe in freedom, in possibilities of real democracy, of people-centered human rights, of peace and livable planet, cannot wait. We must understand that our aspirations must be translated into concrete struggle. We must be clear. Uh -huh. We cannot win without a sharp understanding of the forces of oppression that must be defeated. For bad, it's obvious when we look in the mirror while driving as black that the enemy is not the Iraqis, Russians, Syrians, or Venezuelans. Yes. U.S. out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Oppose Trump domestic surge targeting black people. Stop the Department of Defense 1033 program that militarizes police forces. Shut down Africa and all U.S. and NATO bases. Cut a obscene military budget by 50% or 100%. Who's ready to walk to the Trump Hotel? All right, let's go. Good to be back. And props to my man with the sign, Occupy My Ass, Not Iran. Award for most original sign. Every time I come up here, after some regime change plot, I feel like you know I'm doing a George Carlin impersonation because the people behind us are so stupid and crazy. It's hard to know what to say. Uh, yesterday, there was, and I'm not I'm not even Lee Camp, so I'm not good at doing George Carlin. Okay. Um, by the way, it's nice to see so many people here. Usually, it's just like everyone who came to my birthday party or whatever. So, this is nice. This is good. This is encouraging. You know what I'm saying? This is an actual resistance that's starting to build after a few years. Okay. Yesterday, the State Department had a stupid and crazy briefing, and they were asked to provide evidence that Qasem Soleimani was going to commit an act of war and carry out attacks. And the response from used car salesman Robert Palladino, AKA State Department spokesman, was, Jesus, do we have to explain this to you people? That was his response. There's no evidence that is being provided at all to explain, to justify this attack. But let me explain to you 
why Qasem Soleimani was killed. It's very simple, because he rolled back the Salafi Jihadi forces that the U.S., the CIA, had been backing in Syria to destabilize another independent sovereign country, and he helped prevent by organizing the popular mobilization units, Hashd al Shabi, he helped prevent Iraq from becoming a U.S. client state. It is that simple. And the assassination of Qasem Soleimani is revenge for his success in rolling back the most vicious imperial plot that we've seen in recent years, which sought to have black flags, the black flags of ISIS and Al Qaeda, the organization responsible for the 9 11 attacks flying over Middle Eastern cities. Qasem Soleimani is being mourned in Iran for that reason. And this country is now in danger again because of the insanity of people who have actually emboldened the authors of the 9-11 attacks. That's what's going on here. And we need to make that clear to everyone because the evidence isn't being provided by mainstream media. And there hasn't been a resistance for years, because of the congressional Democrats, what have they been doing? Nothing. Seeking, seek, where have they been? Where have they been? They've been seeking to impeach Donald Trump for not being warlike enough on Russia and for not sending offensive military weapons to a Ukrainian military that is incorporated in its National Guard, the Azov Battalion, a neo-Nazi battalion. Why should we be complaining that they're not getting weapons? What they should have been doing is resisting a $735 million NDAA and not stripping out a resolution that would have stopped this goddamn war to run in the first place. So it's up to us to be in front of their offices. It's up to us to be informing our fellow citizens about the lies we're being told. It's up to us to be in the face of a bought out, sold out corporate media. It's up to us to be the real resistance. The resistance hasn't been out here at all. They've been pushing for more war, not less. And we have to make one thing clear, that if war comes on Iran, it will be for the same reason that this government has been threatening war on Venezuela, on North Korea, on Syria, and why they've done just done regime change in Bolivia. Because these countries refuse to be absorbed into the empire. We need to stand in support of independent states and international law and support their right to be sovereign. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Code Pink. Thank you, Answer Coalition, for putting this together. And thank you to all of you here for turning out. I have not been to Iran, covered the situation on the ground there, but I can tell you that I was in Syria last year. And the first time that I ever drove into Damascus and was struck by the massive Syrian flag, actual Syrian flag, still waving over the city, I was emotional because I thought that if it had been up to the people in this building behind us and the other people in this city, that flag would have been replaced with a black flag of the Islamic State, ISIS, in, in, in uh, the Islamic State, Syria and Iraq. And I can tell you, everyone that I met in Syria is eternally grateful for the sacrifice made by their own people and the Iraqi people who fought alongside them in ridding the Islamic State, and that included Major General Qasem Soleimani and the Al-Quds forces. I was just speaking with an Iranian academic in Tehran. I did a video interview with him, and I asked him why was Major General Soleimani seen as such a hero across the region, not only in Iran, and not even only in Iraq and Syria, but in Lebanon, in Yemen. He told me this was the exact word he used because he was seen as an anti-imperialist fighter. He was leading the resistance access to the evil our government and our military and our empire have brought on the region. And so we also have to keep in mind that the war in Iran did not the war on Iran did not begin with the US's assassination of Major General Soleimani. It began decades ago when the U.S. overthrew their first democratically elected Prime Minister, Mohammad Mossadegh. It continued when the United States backed Iran's foe in the brutal Iran-Iraq war, Saddam Hussein, which the U.S. later betrayed and destroyed his country as well. And it continued when President Bush declared Iran to be the axis of evil 
That was a wish list for regime change. And it has most, in the most savage way, continued in the form of unilateral course of measures, economic sanctions, what Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif describes as economic terrorism, which the United States is waging against the Iranian people every moment, every day, even when a bomb does not drop, people are dying because of this financial war. Yeah. And Iran is not the only victim of this silent war. It is not only Syria, Iraq, the people of the region, it is not only Korea, Vietnam, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, all of the people, Zimbabwe, who are forced to live under U.S. financial terrorism. It is also the people in this country. It is the people in Baltimore. It is the people in D.C. who don't have homes, who don't have education, because our empire sacrifices the public at home in order to sustain its brutal military abroad. And we have to build the connections between what's happening there and what's happening here. And we can't only be out here when there is a, a strike and, and the feeling that all-out war could unleash at any moment because we are waging a war against not only the people of Iran, against so many sovereign and independent people of the world. And it is my mission to help bring that to an end. And are all of you with me? Yeah. That's what I thought. That's why we're going to march to Trump Tower right now. All right, how y'all feeling? <laughs>